you're passionate about that as well, are you? I'm just passionate about people knowing and being careful, yeah. you know, because most people don't. Oh, good morning, everybody. Hi, Bridget and Kelly. Great to have you here. Hi, Hi everybody. We've been having an amazing discussion here in the background <laughs> about cyber crimes. Um, but uh, Kelly is just putting the brighteners up us here. Um, maybe we could do a workshop on that in a couple of months. <laughs> Let's see who we have with us this morning. Louise, Elizabeth, C uh, Catherine, Deirdre, uh, Catherine and Davina. We have you all in the chat. Good morning to you all, ladies. And then we have Jennifer, Deirdre, Davina, Elizabeth, Louise, Catherine, Helen, Ray, Susan, Daniel, Angela, uh, Kelly, um, Mr. or Mrs. Kelly, not sure. Alma, Emer, uh, Leia, um, Wendy, Marie, Catherine, Audrey, David, we have a lot of Catherines here today. <laughs> um, let's see, Susan, good morning to you in the chat, Wendy in the chat, Ray in the chat. Great to see everybody here this morning. How is everybody doing? I hope you're all ready for day three. Do we have any newbies on the call? Is there anyone here for the first day? Hopefully not. Um, Daniel said, um, what don't people know sounds interesting. Oh, right, what we were talking about. Kelly has just Kelly does a lot of training in cyber security and infosec. Uh, so if any if anybody needs anything, someone give us a talk. It's very simplistic. It's 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 not it's not technical. Yeah, very scary. She's just been telling us that um, how if you have anything in your home that's connected to the internet, as in a smart home, um, you can be hacked. Yeah, basically. And always have blue tacker or some sort of a sticker over your <laughs> your your webcams or your phone cameras because they're all used and they're all tapped into. And yes, they are listening to us. <laughs> Basically, in a nutshell, that's what she's been telling us. So Bridget, she we started this conversation yesterday. So as and from about five past ten yesterday, Bridget has had blue tack stuck on her camera phone um in the office. So um if it's good enough for yeah. Mark Zuckerberg, it's good enough for us. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's it's really exciting though. It's a very interesting topic. Really interesting. I know, Daniel. Oh my God, is right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should have a, a chat on this at some stage. But uh, it's becoming more prevalent, I suppose, now that everybody's everybody is connected, Kelly. So it's so it's it's scary how it how your information is being taken without you even being known. But, but to to to, to the, the thought of somebody being able to use and, and this is what Kelly said yesterday, everybody, they can activate your cameras without the little light coming on, so you don't even know that your camera's activated. Ah, yeah. So bit of tape. That's all it is. Bit of tape over the top. Yeah, get this post it <laughs> out now after this call. <laughs> anyway, we have a good crowd here with us. Um, Daniel said it'd be a great workshop. You never know. Watch this space, Daniel. We'll let you know. Um, so good morning. We'll we'll start off. We're at three minutes past ten. So that was a nice little icebreaker for everybody. There you go now. Yeah. So good morning, everybody. My name is Sorka Fanukan and I'm the owner and founder of Trained In. We are absolutely delighted to have been engaged by Taster Success Skillnet to run a series of 60 bite-sized upskilling workshops between the 17th of August and the 18th of December. Today is day three of a three-day uh, PowerPoint um, session with the amazing Kelly Negan from Knowledge Market. And Kelly has been taking us through the how-tos of PowerPoint, so how to actually use the, the software to your best ability as opposed to creating PowerPoint presentations. And I think everybody who's been on the call for the last two days has thoroughly enjoyed, Kelly, um, your sessions. And we've been getting a lot of praise, which I will pass on to you um, when I get to get the, all the emails. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we go. Most of you know at this stage, but we can't see you and we can't hear you. So please use the chat facility and we will pass on any of your questions at the end of the session. If you have a question and you don't want to make it public, please pop it into the chat and we will ask your question and withhold your details. I'm also going to put the Taser Success Skillnet learner profile into the chat. And if you have not already done so, please complete that as a Skillnet need this for their records. I'll also pop into the chat towards the end of the session, the three, up, or I think we got four upcoming webinars next week, which are around wellness, finance, assertiveness, and something else which escapes me at the moment. 
But again, very interesting workshops, all free, and all of our sessions are recorded, including this one. So if you have to drop off or can't make the live start date, you will be able to watch the recordings. So before we go on, Kelly, it is absolutely fantastic to have you here again this morning. And I know how crazy busy this time of year is for you. So really appreciate your time. But tell us, what are we going to go through today? Well, today I'm looking at um, shapes. And so I'm going to start out with, with shapes. Um, very, very underestimated, uh, but needed an awful lot within PowerPoint. So I'm just going to show you a few tricks with them. Uh -huh. um, how how because if you're using them uh, particularly if you're creating any kind of a workflow or anything like that you, you need to be able to do it and to do it quickly what you don't want to spend a lot of time so there's a few tricks that i'm going to show you um we're then going to be taking a look at the slide master the slide master is a really important area in powerpoint so it's the template behind it so that's that's going to be kind of the the key area that we'll be looking at uh, today we'll also look at the notes area very simple, but very effective. And then I'm going to show you a few tricks with presenter view and just ordinary presenter mode as well. Amazing, Kelly. Some really interesting things. And I'm going to be glued to your presentation myself today because anybody who uses PowerPoint on a regular basis, if you know all of these tricks, it's so time saving. And it's just amazing what you can do when you know how to do it. So um, just to let everybody know, because our software fights with each other, um, Microsoft and Webinar Jam and different platforms, we have recorded the training session. So what I'm about to show you now is actually recorded, but we're all still here. We're all still paying attention and all we're right. in the chat. We're here. <laughs> um, uh, so we, when we finish the presentation, we will all still be here and we'll go through all of your questions. So without further ado, we will commence and we will see you all shortly. We'll turn off our cameras and see you in a few minutes. Hello, my name is Kelly Megan of Kane Consultancy Services and of KnowledgeMarket.ie. I'm a Microsoft Office training instructor and I've teamed up with TrainedIn to bring you a series of three webinars called A Taste of PowerPoint. And this is the third of those three, so it's the last. Um, everything we've been doing over the last two days is being aimed very much at those who've either never used PowerPoint before or who work on other people's um, PowerPoints. So they never really had to create them before. So it is for those who wouldn't have great knowledge of PowerPoint. Um, I am not making a PowerPoint presentation per se, as you'll know if you've been with us um, over the last two days. What I'm doing is just showing you how to use the different slides and um, little tips and tricks. And I am bringing in features from uh, level two, level three of PowerPoint. So I will be bringing in some of those extra features again today. Now I'm using PowerPoint 365, but just about everything that I do is, you have the ability to do on 2010, 2013, 2016, et cetera. So let's get into it. So I am going to start off by looking at shapes today. So I'm going to scroll down the screen and I'm going to select the last slide and I'm going to add in a new slide and the slide I want to add in is a blank slide. So I'm going up here to the new slide area. I'm going to the lower half of the button because I know that I want a blank slide. I'm going to choose blank and in goes my blank slide. Now I'm going to work with um, shapes. Now, when I'm working with shapes of any kind, there's a few features that I like to turn on. One I've already got turned on that you would not necessarily have turned on yourself, and that is the ruler. So I have the ruler on, I work with it on all the time. Just to let you know, it is not on in PowerPoint by default. It's contained on the view tab and by default, it is not there. So you should make it your business when you're working in PowerPoint, have this on at all times, view tab, ruler. Now, just to let you know, if you choose that and then you decide, oh, I'm not working with PowerPoint today and you close down, you don't bother saving. When you come back the next time, the ruler will still be open. So turning on the ruler is um, it's a global feature. It doesn't require PowerPoint being saved to keep it turned on. 
So I have it turned on permanently um, and I would recommend everyone to have it turned on permanently. The other thing that can be a good idea to work with is to work with things like the grid lines. So I'll just show you those. Grid lines, these are these dotted lines that you can see here on the screen. Now, these lines are not movable, so I can't grab them and drag them anywhere, but they're great for helping me um, to position things. The other lines, if I just turn off the grid lines, the other ones are the guides. The guides I love because these are movable. You can see that the guides are set at the zero point on the vertical and the zero point on the horizontal and they can be grabbed and moved and if I need to move something to the nine point on that side I can then double check that it's on the nine point on the other side. So guides lovely um, feature that I would use an awful lot with my shapes. So I'll be turning on and off some of these as I go along. So first off, I'm just going to start with, I'm leaving these guides on and I'm just going to start with my ordinary shapes. So in PowerPoint, you'll have your shapes on your home tab here in the drawing area. You'll also have them on the insert tab here. It doesn't matter which one you work with, it's exactly the same. So I'm just going to have a, a quick look at some different shapes and just give you some ideas of how they work. So this little button here is the rectangle button. If I click onto that, um, uh, you'll see my cursor has changed to uh, a crosshair. If I click, hold down the click, notice that the shape comes out from its top left hand corner and the shape is very, very fluid. So I can make it any type of rectangle that I like. Once I, I've um, deselected, or rather once I've dropped it and it is selected, you can see I've got a shape format tab and then I can work on the shape. Now, I'm not going to do any work on this, but I'm going to take advantage of the tab and I'm going to pick up the same shape again. If I want to have a perfect square, then I take the rectangle, I click, hold down my click, but I also hold down my shift key and the shift key constrains the size. And if I was to lift off the shift key, you can see it becomes fluid again. Hold, if I grab it and place it there and hold down the shift key, you can see it forces it to a square. So if I want to get my perfect square, then I'm going to have my shift key held down while I'm dragging out and I release the mouse before I release the shift key. So your fluid rectangle is just your normal click and drag to whatever size you want, but your square is holding down your shift key. Now, the next shape that I'm going to look at is the oval. And if I click onto the oval again, I'll do it over in this um, area. I'm going to click and drag and please notice it comes out from the top left hand corner. All shapes come out from that top left hand corner. It is very, very fluid. So you can see that I can have it any type of oval I like. And again, I've dropped it. I'm now going to pick the same oval shape. And if I want to have this as a perfect circle, then I'm going to hold down the shift key when I click, hold down the click and I drag it out. And you can see it's absolutely constrained. If I was to drop the shift key, again, it goes back to being fluid press the shift key and it goes back to being constrained. So when you're doing this, just release the mouse first and then release the shift key afterwards and that keeps it constrained. Now, the thing to remember with these shapes is if you adjust the shape later, you have to do the same thing. So if I come back and adjust this, I make it my business to hold down the shift key first before I go for the corner and adjust it, otherwise it turns fluid. Same with the circle, click on it, hold down the shift key and adjust it from that point. So that's our shapes. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention is I wanted to mention about um, the way it's coming from the corner. There are times when you want a shape to be, for instance, here, dead center. If I take out my oval, place my cursor into the that corner there and I click and drag. Can you see how it's coming out from that top left hand corner? Just like I, I said to you a moment ago. So I'm going to undo that. 
So how do I get it so that my oval is directly, or my circle, is directly center to the point that I want it on? So I'll click that. I bring my cursor to that center point, and I'll use that because we can see clearly it's a center point. And I'm going to hold down my shift key, and that's going to constrain it to a circle, but I'm also going to hold down my control key. And when I hold down both of them, it constrains the shape and draws it from the center. And I'll release the cursor, release the shift and the control. So if I want to draw from a center point, it's shift and control. Otherwise, it's always going to bring the shape out from the top left hand corner. So all shapes can be brought out from their center point by using the shift and the control together. OK, so that's just looking at um, some of our different shapes. Now, I've decided I want to delete these shapes. And uh, to do that, um, I'm going to select them all together. Now, just to show you, if I want to select them all together, I'll just move one slightly out of the way. The quick way to select them all together is to surround the highlight with an invisible highlight. So I click and drag. It's like an invisible box release the click and they all get selected. Now you have to completely surround them for this to work. So that's why I shifted this over. Watch what happens if I click and drag, but now the edge of this box here is touching that one on the right. That means it will not get selected. So selecting with your invisible box, click and drag all the way around so none of the edges can touch any of the shapes and then I can select them all and delete them all in one go. Perfect. OK, I'm going to go to my view tab and I'm going to turn off the guides for a moment and I think I'll turn on the grid lines and I'm going to bring out uh, a shape onto the screen and I'm going to bring it out and this might be something I'd want to do. For instance, I might want to do some class of a workflow and um, you have a certain amount of workflows uh, built in automatically into the smart art feature but um, I often find I end up making these things myself if I want a bit more detail. So I'm just going to show you how I would create um, a workflow and not not so much create the workflow itself but just show you how I go about um, putting out the, the shapes. So if I go to my my home tab, I'll actually go to my home tab and I'm going to open up this toolbar here. So I'm clicking on the more button and I'm coming down to the flowchart area. So you have very specific types of shapes that are used for flowcharts. Now, I'm not going to worry about the different types of shapes, uh, etc. cetera. Um, what you can do for one, you do for the others. I just want to show you how I can use these particular shapes. So I'm going to, to pick this very first one, um, the uh, process. And I'm going to use these boxes here to just to help me knowing it comes from the top left hand corner. And I'm going to say I want to make that roughly the size of those two squares so I can keep my shapes now to that size. Now, if I want to, I can bring each shape out individually and I can size it. But there's another way of doing this. And that is that once I've got my shape um, made, I keep it selected. And on the keyboard, I go control D. And what that does is create a duplicate. Now, if I then place that duplicate right on top, and then I'm going to hold down my shift key while I drag this down. Now, the reason for holding the shift key is to constrain the shape so that it's totally in line with this one. So it doesn't go out of line. I'll just con drag it down another little bit so I'm constraining it. At no stage have I deselected and this that's really really important. You cannot deselect if you're going to do what I'm about to do. So I created the first one. I didn't deselect the first one. I just went control D which put the selection onto the second one. I dragged the second one on top of the first one and then I use my shift key to drag this down. So one or other of these shapes has been selected at all times. Now I want to do another couple of these boxes. I want the same distance between them and I want the same box. And this is where the little bit of magic happens. I can now using the keyboard, hold down control and press D 
D, 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 D. And what happens is the control D, the duplicate feature, what it's doing is duplicating not just the box, it's duplicating the distance that I dragged that second box from the first one. And it only works as long as I didn't deselect and break that magic um, before doing the control D. So the duplicate will also duplicate the distance. Really, really clever little feature when you want to put multiples um, of the same thing on the screen. Now, I'm just going to um, delete that one, that one, and that one. So let's just delete those out. I'm just going to leave those uh, four on the screen. And I just want to show you how I would put connectors between the boxes. So I'll, what I'll do is I'll turn off the grid lines to make sure you can see this properly. If you've ever um, tried this, what usually happens is that you, you go in, you pick up your connector, and I'm just going to go for this one here, the line arrow, and you click on that and you rest your cursor over the shape. And when you do that, it'll always show you where you can connect from. And then I'm going to pick from here and I click and I hold down the click. And when I come down here, it'll show me where I can connect to and I'll drop it. And then I have to go back up and get the, the button again. And I have to do that, in this case, only three separate times. Well, even three times is too much. So I'm going to show you how I would do that in real life. So what I do, and I can actually see the line is there. I've, because I've just used it, it's gone up here to the top. And what I do is I get it open, whether it's open in the More button or I get it here, and I right click on it. And then I just choose Lock Drawing Mode. and you'll notice now that it's selected. And what that does is it keeps it selected. So I don't have to keep going back up. I bring my cursor to here. I click, hold down the click, and I drag down to here. I, you can see it's still going. Click, hold down the click, drag it to here. Click, hold down the click, drag it to here. And I actually have to turn this feature off. I don't turn it off by clicking. If I click onto the slide, I'm going to get a line appearing on the slide. I have to go up here and turn the feature off. So I just wanted to show you that if you are going to create your, um, your own uh, workflows, your own shapes, et cetera, that there are ways of doing this um, that can speed it up, that it's not as slow a process as it might seem. So that's just to give you a quick idea as to how we deal with these areas. OK, the next place that I want to take a, a look at is I want to take a look at the Slide Master. Now, the Slide Master is a really, really important area in PowerPoint because it is the area that controls PowerPoint. It's behind it. And the Slide Master is where you go if you want to make changes to all your slides in one go. So for instance, I've decided that maybe I would like the company logo, whatever the company logo is, to be on every single slide in the presentation. Now, I've only got nine slides uh, in, in mine. You know yourselves um, from work, the reality is you could have 100 slides in your slide deck. And if you have to have your logo on every single one of them, what you do not want to do is have to manually put it on to every single one. So that's where the Slide Master comes into play. Now, where is the Slide Master? The Slide Master can be accessed through the View tab and through the Master Views button uh, group here. Now, I want you to notice I'm on the title slide and I'm going to go in now to the Slide Master. Now, when you come into this area, it's going to look quite different to what it looks like on the front end. So you don't see any of the things that you've done on the front end. You're seeing the master, the layout that is behind each of the slides. Now, you'll notice that this says click to edit master title style. So this master that I'm on, which is this one here, is the master 
for the individual slide called the title slide. Now, I'm just going to close out of here for a moment and I'll come back in, but I want to explain this further because this can be really, really confusing. But when you go into the lower half of the new um, slide button or into the layout button, you've got different layouts, a title slide layout, a title and content layout, etc. Each and every one of these layouts has its own master in the background. So I was on the title slide, so that meant when I went in there, I was on the title slides master. So again, I'm on the title slide, I go to the view tab, and I go to the slide master. I have landed onto the title slide layout, and you can see from the tooltip, I hope you can read that, it says used by slide one. Now, there's a trick to this because each of those layouts has its own master. But when you come into the, into, the, into the slide master, you have to remember to scroll up. Such a simple thing, and this catches so many people. This is the overarching master, whereas each of these are the individual layout master. If you want to put something on every single slide, you must come on to the overarching master. And if you see there, if I rest my cursor on that, it says office theme slide master used by slides one to nine. Whereas if I come down to this one, this is the title and content master, and it says it's used by slide two, slides four to six, and slide eight. And then if I come down, and this is going to be my two content slide, and I use that on uh, slide three and slide seven. But this one is telling you, if you work on me, I will affect every slide because I am the overarching master. Okay, so that's the trick of using the master. When you come in, always scroll up. It's such a simple thing that catches people out. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put in our logo. Now, I, I don't have a logo. I'm just going to use a shape and pretend that that's the company logo. It's not about what I'm actually using to put in here. It's about seeing that it does appear on every single uh, slide. So I'm going to go to the insert tab. And of course, if you're inserting your own logo, you just insert a picture through here. I'm just going to insert a shape. And I'm going to go for, and let's take a look. I think I will pop down here and I am going to go for this little moon shape. So I've clicked on that and I'm just going to drag it out. Now I'll drag it out here on, on the middle of the slide and I'll just drag it out like that and watch the left hand side when I release my cursor. So this is the one that I'm on. And when I release the cursor, you see it flying down and appearing on every single master that's contained in there. Okay, great stuff. So all you have to do now is resize. And I'm going to just resize this right, right down. I'll make it small like that. And I am going to spin it around a tad. And as I do, you can see it happening on them all. And I'm going to pop it up there um, in the right hand corner. Actually, I'll make it a little bit bigger. Again, this will help me to show you some stuff. And there it is. And it's now contained on every single slide. I'm going to close out of the master. And by the way, just um, want to mention before I go out of here, if you do go to the insert tab uh, and you get, you get effectively stuck on that tab and you're going, how do I get out of here? Just to note that the slide master tab is the only tab that doesn't appear at the end. It always appears between the file tab and the home tab, and it just can be a little bit confusing because you're not expecting it to be there. So you go to slide master tab between file and home, and that's where you'll find your close master view. And you can close out of it there. So you can see that that has appeared on every single slide. Now, I'm going to go back in and I'm going to shift it down a little bit because I want you to see something with that. 
Um, so I'm going to go view slide master. Remember the trick. Scroll up onto the slide master. I'm going to pick that. I'm going to put it there right in the way of where I might have. Um, I make it bigger. I might have uh, columns in my chart. Definitely it'll it'll sit on the, the table there. So I'll close out of it. And I'm just going to go to our table and I want you to see that it sits in behind it. I'll just come down to the smart art. I want you to see that it sits in behind it. And again, with our chart that it sits behind it. So be aware when you're placing your logo that it needs to go somewhere where something on the front end isn't going to completely and utterly override it. Now, the nice thing about this is that I can't select it. So if I'm if I'm doing this for somebody and I'm giving them the template and this will be the case for your company, uh, they like putting things onto the master because you can't select it on the front end. You have to know that you go to the view tab, slide master, and you can't select it on the individual masters either. It has to be selected on the one that it was input on. So you scroll up onto the overarching master and that's where you would select your logo or whatever it is that you have put in. So that's just to show you how you can put in a, a logo, etc. Now, something else that I want to, to look at uh, doing within the slide master is that maybe I don't want to use the Calibri font anymore. I've decided I'm, I'm fed up with the Calibri font and I want a different font on all my slides. Well, I'm not going to do that kind of work on the front end because I'd have to select the text on every single slide and from the home tab, I'd have to go to the font button and change the font. So I do it here on the master and again, I come up to the overarching master because I want to do this on every slide. So in the slide master area, you see there's an area here called backgrounds. And this is what I'm interested in is this button called fonts. So I'm going to click onto that. And this is the font that's been used within this template. This is the office template. So again, you'll be using your own company template and they'll be using uh, whatever font. And by the way, please don't go in and start changing your company's template. They make it a template because they don't want it to be changed. Only change things if you have permission. This is how you would create your own template. OK, so um, I've decided I don't want the office font. If I don't like that, I can pick another font family and it is a family. There's, uh, for instance, with the office one, Calibri Light is what is used for the title styles, whereas Calibri Body is what's used for the ordinary styles down here. So each family is made of two fonts. Generally, they're the same, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's one font for the heading and a different font uh, for the body, like this one here. One Calibri for the heading and Cambria for the body. So you can scroll through that and you can see it's changing there on the master as I'm resting my cursor on it. And you can pick any of the font families that they've got created here. If you don't like the font families that are created there, you can come down here at the bottom and you can customize it to suit yourself. So I'm going to scroll back up and I'm going to pick. Um, let's take a look. Yeah, I think I'll go for the Century School book. It's not that I like it, but it's it's it is definitely noticeable and I want it to be noticeable. Now I'm go I haven't clicked this yet. Keep your eye over here on the left hand side. I know it's hard to see, but when I click, you should see it pushing down through all the slides. So I'm going to click there and that's it. You should see it pushing down through all of the masters. And what that means is that if I close out of this now. And I come back any slide that I look at. The font will have changed on all the slides all in one go. And the important thing to recognize, it's not just the existing slides. If I come up here, I'm on the first slide. So if I come up here and I go to the lower half of, of new slide, can you see that all the layouts have the logo on them? So if I add in a new slide, it's going to have the logo on it, but it's also going to have the font because I've changed the font for the entire presentation.
So don't use these buttons here, these front end buttons. They're to be used if you want to make a single change, a change to one little piece of text, but they're not to be used if you want to do it to all of them because it's just too much work. So your slide master is the key to that type of thing. Now, I'm just going to select that slide there and delete it because I don't want it. OK, so the next area that I want to look at is I want to look at the notes area. I haven't looked at it um, up to this stage, and it is an area that is really, really important. For those of you who are on older versions of PowerPoint, you will have uh, an extra area down here at the bottom. It's called the notes area. Now, for those of us on 365, it's opened using this button or it can be dragged with the mouse. Hopefully you can see my cursor there. Um, I'll open it with this so you can, you can uh, see it that way. I just click and that's the little area that people on older versions will have that they will have been missing on this version. Now, this area is where you take notes for each of your slides. And this area, if I bring my cursor onto that, can be made as large as you need it to be. If you're finished with your slides, get this um, up so that you can see what it is that you're typing in, um, because this is now the area that you're concentrating on. So our notes are all to do with giving our presentation. So when we are giving our presentation and we are up in presentation mode, so that's the slideshow button down here on the right, um, we often want to be able to see what it is we want to talk about and have notes as to what it is we want to talk about. So if I click into here and I might want to say, um, uh, don't forget the story about uh, the Excel chart going wrong. I might have a, another one. Um, uh, remember about uh, Outlook email. It doesn't matter what it is. It's whatever reminds you to say whatever it is that you want to say. If I want to, I can bullet these just the way I would bullet anything else. Um, I set it up so that it makes it easy for me uh, when I'm going through my presentation to know what it is that I'm going to talk about. I'll bring that down a little bit. I'll click onto the next one and um, I might turn around here and say, um, uh, speak about the problems on project uh, two. So there might be issues with that particular one and I can click onto that. So I can go on to each of these and I can put notes in uh, particularly handy when you're dealing with your charts and you want to be able to speak about each individual area on the chart, then you can put your notes in here. So I'm just going to leave it on the two that I've done it and I'm going to show it to you then in presentation mode. So that notes area, it, it seems like a very, very small little area, but it's actually an incredibly important area. So what we're going to finish off with is we're going to finish off uh, looking at this in presentation mode. And I'm going to just show you a few things. Now, I'm clicking back onto the first slide and I'm coming down to the slideshow button in the bottom right hand corner and I'm going to bring this up into presentation mode. So remember we put on the transition called cube and that's that movement onto the screen. Now, if I am given a presentation and I have the option and the ability to do so, I will plug in another screen into my laptop. And when I do that, then I will no longer see my presentation in this way. My audience will continue to see it in this way, but because I've got two screens, my look will change and I'll change over to a view called presenter view. Now, I can't show you um, the two views at the same time. So in other words, I'd be looking at my presenter view on my laptop and I'd be looking at the audience view on my second screen. I can't show you the two views at the same time, but what I can do is move between the two views and show you what it would look like. So 
I'm going to just move my cursor on, on the screen. The cursor, when you go into presenter mode, your cursor by default will vanish. But if you continue to move your mouse for a second, or <clears throat> excuse me, if you continue to move your mouse for a second or two, your cursor will appear on the screen. Now, when that appears, you'll also notice that a set of buttons down in the bottom left hand corner appear because when you want your, when you ask your mouse to appear, it's usually because you want to use some of these buttons. Now, the only button that I'm going to use is this one here, which is going to allow me to get out a menu. Now, personally, I do not use these buttons in real life because the audience can see you doing this. But to show you what the presenter view looks like, I'm going to use them so I can swap over to it. So I'm going to change over to this other view that you would normally have when you have two screens. And I'm going to click onto that. And this is presenter view. So in presenter view, what I get to see is this screen, which is what the audience are seeing. And then I get to see the next screen so I know what's coming. And then most importantly of all, I get to see whatever notes that I have. So absolutely love this view. So let's just move on to the next one so that um, I can see, do I have any notes on that next slide? So I'm going to advance to the next slide. And as soon as I do, I can see here on the right, the next item that's going to be appearing when I give a click. And as long as this slide is on the screen, I will have these notes here. The audience cannot see it. This is what the audience is seeing, not what's going on on this side. This is particularly effective if you've ever been in that awful position, and I think most of us have, where you are asked to give a presentation at the last minute and you are asked to present slides you have never seen before and that awful thing of just not knowing what is coming next. This gives you at least a little bit of advance warning, which is fantastic. So if I was to move on through that, and I'll just, that one there, next one, next one, and I can see this is going to be the last one. And it changes to let me know that this is what's coming next. So again, if I just move on to that one, that's what the client is seeing. And then I'll bring in my three items. And of course, I can see the notes for this one. And now I can see what's coming up next. So fantastic gives me great advance notice. Now, a couple of things I want to show you down here that you can use as well. This little button here on the left is your pen and laser pointer tool. When you click on that, the audience cannot see the fact that you are clicking on that. Even if the menu goes up the top here, they will not see it. You're just going to change over to the laser pointer. All they see is that you now have a laser pointer on the screen, but they don't see you making that change. Equally, you can change over to a pen, a highlighter, and um, if I want to write something on the screen, I can do so. I come back in, I can choose, <clears throat> excuse me, I can choose the uh, eraser and I can come back into here and I can go back to my arrow. And I'm just going to put my automatic arrow back onto that. So I can make um, those changes without the audience seeing anything. The next little button allows me to look at all slides at once. So if I click onto that, now again, the audience is still seeing this. They don't see this view here, but this comes in really handy if I want to move to, say, this photo slide next rather than to table. And I would just click on that and it would act for the audience as if it was the next slide. And again, I can just back out of this and the audience hasn't seen me do any of that. This little button allows me to zoom. So if I if I click that, I get this light and I can and again, they don't see me doing this and they don't see this light. But when I then click on something, so I click, it zooms into that. And that's what they see is the zoom. And if I pan, they see the pan. They don't see the hand. They just see the pan. And again, if I click this, it'll zoom out. And that's what they see. 
If you are presenting and someone asks a question, it is a really good idea if you want people to pay attention to both the question and the answer that you're going to give to get their attention away from the slide, particularly if the slide has writing on it, because if a slide has text on it, people can't help but read it. It's a really good idea to black out your screen. So it's just a click to black it out. When the question's answered, you bring it back up again. Now, this little button is the subtitles button. This is brand new to 365. I'm not going to be going through that. Uh, and as I say, it is, it's literally only here in the last day or two. But it, as it says, it, it allows you to put subtitles onto the slide. And then this little button allows me to go back to the normal presentation show. So I'm going to go back to the presentation show, i.e. what the client or the audience is seeing. Now, when if you are having to give your presentation in this mode, is there anything that you can do? Yes, there is. So um, if you're caught in this, obviously you won't be able to see your notes coming up, uh, etc. But what you can do is you can use the keyboard and you can go control L to change your mouse to a laser. So now you have a laser and you haven't had to go down to those buttons which are down in the bottom left hand corner um, at where, the, where the audience can see what you're doing. Control L again will turn the laser off. Control P will give you a pen so that you can draw on your screen. If you change your mind, control P again will take the pen away. So it goes back to hiding. But actually, I want to erase that. Control E is going to give me my eraser. Click, click, control E again will hide the eraser. The last one I want to show you is that if I want to go straight to my photo slide, my photo slide was slide seven. And I'd like to go straight to that, but it's not the next slide. We know that the table is the next slide. I can just type seven and press enter. And again, you can see the cube. It acts as if this was the next slide. So I can use a lot of these features in my normal presentation mode. OK, I'm going to escape out of that. And that brings to an end our uh, three sessions of A Taste of PowerPoint. And I just want to thank you so much for being with us on these days. Thank you.